two men waving at one person. Can, look at the two men wave. Can you wave again? Yes, you. And the one next, you were waving. Who are you waving to? Look, person there, you can come and join those two people. <laughs> it's all about connecting. <laughs> so thank you all to join us again for this second keynote by Sean Bain. She's professor, professor of digital education at the University of Edinburgh. And she manages to combine the human and the machine aspect. Now, that is something I really look forward to. And I think she's one of the great visioneers in that section because she comes up with new ideas all the time, which is why she made it to this recent promotion. So I ask you to give a great applause to Sean Bain. Thank you, Inga. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk about teacher bots, but don't be alarmed. Um, OK. This, this, is the, this is what I'm going to cover um, in the next 30 minutes, 30, 40 minutes or so of this keynote. I want to, um, I want to think newly about the question of teacher automation. So I'm going to start by just um, uh, talking a little bit about what the current debates around the automation of the teacher are. And I'm going to expand from that into an area of theory and literature which um, talks about the, the divide between people and technologies, between humans and machines in digital education. Uh, I'm then going to ask for your tolerance as I deviate a little bit into talking about Twitter bots um, as a cultural form. Um, and the reason I want to do that will become clear in um, my final sections where I'm going to talk about a particular Twitter bot, which we call TeacherBot, um, that we used and developed for one of our MOOCs. And I want to raise at the end the, uh, the, the idea that the way we used this teacher bot kind of gave us a way of rethinking and thinking critically about what teacher automation might mean um, in the current era. So the question of, of teacher automation is one that has been kind of um, debated um, a lot over recent decades, and I'll give some of the history of this debate in a minute. Um, but in, in the context of contemporary MOOCs, we are used to these kinds of um, discussion, these kind of areas being talked about, about artificial intelligence in education, about the need for adaptive learning, um, experiments in automated essay scoring, intelligent tutoring, um, smart data-driven universities, um, learning analytics. These are all aspects of the interface between the human MOOC teacher um, and the machinic that we are kind of actively working with. Many of us in this room, I suspect, are actively working with these ideas and these areas of development currently. Um, we talk a lot about platform embedded uh, pedagogies. So, you know, for example, FutureLearn talks about being developed around an idea of social constructivism. Uh, of course, Sierra has mastery learning. Many MOOC platforms um, use this idea that pedagogy isn't just um, placed, with, placed upon a teaching event by the teacher, but is actually embedded in the material networked infrastructures of a particular MOOC. So these are all different ways of thinking about what it means to work with the machinic in the context of MOOC teaching. But I'm going to go back in time a little bit before I, before I come back to 2000 and what are we, 15 now. Um, Patrick Supers in the 1960s, who's one of the first um, uh, researchers in I guess you might would now call it um, educational technology in, in um, Stanford, said that, you know, this was over 40 years ago, one can predict that in a few more millions of, in a, in a few more years, we will all have access to an automated tutor who will be for us what Aristotle was for um, Alexander the Great, um, as well informed, as responsive, as always on. Um, so that was, a, that was a while ago, um, hasn't happened yet, um, for reasons which, I hope that we will be able to discuss this afternoon. So, 
zooming forward in time a little bit to 1980, there's this famous article in Omni magazine um, written by Arthur C. Clarke, um, who talked about here about electronic tutors. It's a very prescient article in many ways. He predicts the um, development of the iPad, among other things. Um, but he, it's a problematic article um, in ways which will become clear. I'm going to talk about this article for the next couple of slides. One of the things that Arthur C. Clarke says um, in this piece of work is that technology's influence on education is nothing new. There's an old saying that the best educational setup consists of a log with a teacher at one end and a pupil at the other. Our modern world is not only woefully short of teachers, it's running out of logs. Um, it's an interesting quote, but it's also deeply problematic. I mean, uh, I guess Eugene Morozov might call this classic solutionism, right? You construct this situation where we're running out of teachers and, and, and schools in the way that we might run out of coal or oil. Um, whereas, in fact, if we're running out of teachers, it's because we have made a certain um, selection of political and economic choices. Um, so Arthur C. Clarke does what, uh, and it's something which I think we see over and over again in debates on educational technology, a, a, a kind of a problem is posed, which may or may not be a real problem, and then a solution is, is proposed, which is usually um, technological. And that's the case in this Arthur C. Clarke um, article. He says a bit later on that the electronic tutor is going to spread across the planet as swiftly as the transistor radio with even more momentous consequences. And this is the interesting bit. No social or political system, no philosophy, no culture, no religion can withstand a technology whose time has come. So in a sense, this is pure essentialism, pure determinism, right? Every kind of, every kind of social activity every, um, is, can be kind of bulldozed by um, a technological development. So this was 1980, but by the time we get to 2011, in fact, to the current day, we are still not seeing this massive, um, utter, utterly transformative um, movement towards the or existence of the electronic tutor. So Joshua Underwood and Rose Luckin reported just a couple of years ago that artificial intelligence systems um, in education are still not very um, well known about, they're not very well used. Um, this is because they, they say we haven't, as artificial intelligence developers, we haven't explained why we should be using them. That could be partly the issue. Partly the issue could be that there are, um, there are resistances to the notion of automation which are very well founded um, among educators and students. So we have a kind of um, a body of research where um, uh, theorists critique critique this kind of um, possibility of the automated tutor, and not only the possibility of the automated tutor, but the inevitability which is constructed over decades of um, uh, future-looking writing around automation and teaching. So Andrew Feenberg, for example, 10 or so years ago, said that this is, um, you know, there's a politics behind this. The goal of corporate strategists, futurologists, is to replace for the masses face-to-face -face teaching by professional faculty with an industrial project infinitely reproducible at decreasing unit costs. And this was, a, again, more than a decade ago, but it's a, it's a kind of um, argument which we've seen a lot around the MOOC debates um, over the last two or three years. Uh, how, how can we maximize the efficiency of this new model of industrial production of learning opportunity? And it's, this is a kind of a, uh, this is a kind of perspective on education and technology, which has, you know, driven a lot of funding opportunities. So the um, UK uh, Research Council's uh, Technology Enhanced Learning Programme um, had a whole strand devoted to this notion of productivity, which Diana Lorillard um, defined as improved, uh, improved quantity of learner achievement against uh, per unit of teacher time. And there are Horizon 2020 calls out uh, now that, w that construct something similar. We need to de you know, develop technologies um, in order to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of human learning. So there's, a kind of, there's an efficiency um, uh, kind of priority here in, in the funding as well as in a lot of the debate and discourse around this area, efficiency, product, productivity. So what's, who's kind of, who's speaking against this stuff? Where's the critique? Well, there is critique out there. I'm sure many people here have read Neil Selwyn's work. He's published several books, 
describing educational technology, among which we would have to include MOOCs as being ideologically um, shaped along in what he calls individualistic, neoliberal and new capitalist lines. And then uh, that's at the kind of sociological theory level. Practitioners are saying similar things. Uh, there's an, a, a really nice article by Sue Clegg, again from about a decade or so ago, in which she talks about how can critical pedagogy respond to this movement towards automation, efficiency, um, possibly deprofessionalization of the teacher. So she says this critical pedagogy, a critical pedagogy approach, which is the one that she promotes, um, would refocus attention away from the functionality of e-learning environments back to the correlations between students and teachers and the conditions in which they find themselves. So we're seeing in, in this work by Clegg and and, and quite often we're, we're posed with this choice. It's as though we have a choice between thinking about the e-learning environments um, and all their kind of potential for doing things differently, doing things far more faster, more efficiently, with wider reach. That's one choice. And over here is the choice which is human students and teachers working closely together, um, achieving that kind of um, community of scholarship as human beings. And it's almost as though a lot of the academic and research and theoretical discourse divides those two ways of thinking about uh, educational technology and about teacher automation. So that doesn't show so too well, but Andrew Feenberg um, calls this perspective, the, like the one that Clegg has raised here, as, as being about the mobilization of defense of the human touch. Okay, so that's a kind of to a very broad brush kind of um, uh, kind of perspective on automation, those, uh, how it's being promoted and how it's being resisted. For me, I think it's time to kind of move that debate on a little bit and to start to try and think differently about automation and about the relationship between people and computers. And I think this is a problem for educational technology generally in that I, we, we tend to um, subscribe to a way of thinking about our work, which is, it, it, it kind of um, embeds this division between people and technology, between the social and the material, between the human and the automated. So I, I really like this article by um, um, Edward Hamilton and Norm Friesen, where they say that uh, the, the dominant discourses in educational technology are either framed around instrumentalism, in which technology is kind of seen as a toolkit, or essentialism, like the Arthur C. Clarke article I talked about earlier, where technology has its own trajectory, its own power, it's driving change. So we tend, you know, when we're working to an instrumental way of thinking, we tend to say things like it's important to put pedagogy before technology, as though technology can serve pedagogy and leave the former unchanged. Um, or we talk about the enhancement value of technology or, or developing toolkits, all these things which, which make, it, make it seem to us as though technology is within our control and we can simply deploy it um, to a, a predefined set of needs. Essentialist perspectives tend to say things like we need to harness the power of technology um, to change education, we need to transform education, we need to design for new generations who have been completely reformed by technology. So for me, all these discourses are problematic, and I think that this is an area we need to think about critically as researchers and practitioners. Um, and the perspective that I want to propose for how we, how we think differently about this is a broadly socio-materialist perspective, which says that we don't have to think about things and people as being separate from each other, but we need to think about them as working together to perform certain things, one of which is education. And here I'm drawing on um, recent work by Tara Fenwick and Richard Edwards at Sterling, but also a whole body of um, literature in um, the humanities and social sciences, um, from science and technology studies, from critical post-humanism, um, from eco-criticism, from animal studies, all of these things, which are all of these areas of, of theory and thinking that are trying to um, get us to think differently about, about the position of the human within the world and the relationship of the human to the technological. I like this quote from Sarah Watmore because it, it kind of contextualizes these, these kind of debates around educational technology that I think we work with. You know, we always, whether we're, she says, whether one works through the long practiced intimacies between human and plant communities or the skills configured between bodies and tools, one never arrives at a time or place when the human was not a work in progress. 
So she's saying the human is always changing, always responding to technological developments, to ecological changes. Um, we're, not, we're not a fixed entity, neither is the technology a fixed entity. We make each other. Um, and Andrew, Andrew Pickering raises the question of disciplinarity and the ways in which we have to, we have to try this sort of um, epistemological, ontological kind of shift in which we see the human and the non-human together without trying to strip either one away. So my last, my last quote from, um, this is from the Arthur C. Clarke article here, is, you know, where does this leave the human teacher? Any teacher who can re be replaced by a, a machine should be. Um, which I think is a really interesting quote because I think it, it actually, al although on one level it seems simple, it has many layers and we can respond to it as researchers and practitioners in, in many different ways. Um, and the experiment that I want to describe to you in this talk this afternoon is, is, is one such way of trying to rework Arthur C. Clarke's maxim in a creative, um, critical way. Okay, this is the point which I'm going to deviate off a little bit. Have a drink. Okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to teacher automation, but I wanted to say a little bit about Twitter bots. Um, so I'm sure everybody here knows what Twitter bots are. They're programs that tweet on their own without any immediate or direct human input. So you may remember that there was. It was in the Twitter bots were in the news quite a bit uh, last year when Twitter released this data showing that 8.5% of all active users were bots. Um, it subsequently emerged that these weren't all kind of actively um, tweeting bots, but there were still there were a lot of there are a lot of entities using Twitter who are not immediately human. <laughs> most of them, <laughs> yeah, most of them are pushing out spam, um, marketing spam, and so on. But many of them aren't, and those these are the ones that I want to focus on at the moment because I think Twitter <laughs> Twitter bots have become one of the more interesting kind of contemporary cultural forms that uh, are out there on the internet at the moment. Um, so just to give you a few examples of, of bots that I think are interesting and that have informed the, um, the MOOC-related projects I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, so Ami Argaval made this nice, simple um, Twitter bot called Dear Assistant, which when you tweet to any, any question to it, um, it will interrogate Wolfram Alpha and tweet back uh, the response. So you can see the destruction here is asked uh, the bot how many calories are in a Diet Coke, it's 3.7. Um, there's another one by Bill Snitzer, very, and uh, you know, there are many variations of the Quake bot. Um, the Quake bot pulls, it, it doesn't respond to a user's tweet, it pulls data directly from the US Geological Survey um, and functions as a kind of alert service, if you like, for Twitter, uh, Twitter users in um, the LA area. So these are kind of quite you know, useful service bots, if you like. There are others which are much more playful. Um, I realise I'm not sure this one's going to translate all that well for um, people for whom English isn't the first language, but there's one called Stealth Mountain, um, which trawls the internet for people who say sneak peek but spell it wrong. Um, so sneak peek is meant to be when you get an advanced kind of glimpse of something, and it's, it's supposed to be spelt sneak P-E-E-K. But, so this bot kind of searches the internet for anyone spelling sneak peek with a P-E-A-K and corrects them. Um, <laughs> Some people find this really infuriating. This, this nice user was very polite in her response. Uh, there's another, this is one of my favorite Twitter bots, Olivia Tatus, who is, um, uh, it's a bot that tweets as a teenage girl. So the way this one works is that the, um, the bot kind of trawls the internet for teenage girl-like um, phrases and then mashes two tweets up together and, and makes, makes new ones and retweets them out as the Olivia Tatus persona. So some of them are really quite amusing. That's my favorite one. <laughs> I'm crying out of one eye. Um, other, other Twitter bots are a, a bit more kind of uh, playful or, uh, and or poignant. So the Desire bot is a really nice one made by Felix Young, which um, it looks for people tweeting tweets that start with, I just want, and then it goes and finds a random Flickr image using um, using that tweet as keywords, and then posts, posts the tweet back with an image attached. And some of these are lovely. I just want you to hug me and tell me everything is going to be okay like you used to. I just want my mum to come back home. 
I want my bike to be fixed. I just want a puppy. <laughs> and a lot of them are people that just want to go to sleep. <laughs> uh, really a lot. And then, um, yeah. <laughs> so that's a nice one. So these are, you can see the bots, Twitter bots do lots of things. They kind of, they, are, they provide services. They, um, they can be playful. They're funny. There are other bots out there that uh, have a political function. Um, they're what Mark Sample calls uh, bots of conviction. So these are, these are bots that attempt to reveal what he calls the, the, the injustice and inequality in of the world and imagine alternatives. Um, it's a, pro a, a, a computer program that questions how, when, who, and why. A program whose indictments are so specific you can't mistake them for bullshit. Um, and one, of the, one of the ones that Mark Sample has developed is this um, NRA tally bot, which um, NRA, National Rifle Association. So this is quite a chilling one. So the, what the NRA bot does is it, um, it tweets um, f fictional, fictional mass shootings, but, but cobbled together from real ones. So it'll tweet a number, which is minimum of four, which is the US kind of minimum number four of, of deaths that makes it count as a mass shooting. Um, and then a real location, um, a real weapon, and then it will put alongside that a real discursive move from the National Rifle Association. Um, and you can see that the results, uh, the results of this kind of mashup of, of, of tweet and code are quite, are quite chilling and have a very clear political function, which um, the, more you, the, the more of these tweets you look at, um, the more powerful it is. Um, Darius Kazemi's kind of two headline spot, which is another really famous one, um, basically takes two headlines from Google News, mashes them up and, and reposts them. And again, some of these, they're, they're quite amusing, but they're not just amusing. He's, he, he, Darius Kazemi says that they are actually about interrogating Google algorithms and trying to surface in a new way what Google thinks is newsworthy, what counts as news to Google, and is it ridiculous or not? So Rob Dubbin, who um, is the developer that made the uh, Olivia Tater's bot, he, he says that these bots are really important. They're doing important political um, work, which is why some of them count as bots of conviction. Um, he says, at a time when even our most glancing online activities are processed into marketing by for-profit bots in the shadows, Twitter bots foreground the influence of automation on modern life, and they demystify it in the process. So it's kind of turning that invisible, um, that invisible kind of automation that goes on behind the scenes of all our social media usage into something visible and something which it's possible to begin to critique. So that's, that kind of critique is something that we haven't done a great deal of in education to date, although I think there is more and more of that. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about how we developed our own Twitter bot within the context of the e-learning and digital cultures MOOC, um, which we've run three times now from the University of Edinburgh. So to try to connect back to the earlier bits of this talk, this bot wants to do some critical work at the, in, at the boundary interface of the human and the machinic. It wanted to think about teacher automation in a way which wasn't about efficiency gains or about neoliberal performativity. It was about thinking about how, how we could do good teaching in partnership with code, and a very simple code at that. So I want to just pause very briefly to um, name check my colleagues who worked with me on this project, Jeremy Knox, Hamish McLeod, Jeff Hayward, Jen Ross, Hadi Mepuya, Christine Sinclair, John Lee, Chris Speed, and Amy Woodgate at Edinburgh, who all kind of pitched in and made, made, helped to make the t teacher bot. Uh, so to give a little bit of context, we ran this teacher bot within the e-learning and digital cultures MOOC. And I know there are a few alumni, alumni of that MOOC in the room um, uh, towards the end of last year. Uh, this is, it, it's, it's a, a Coursera MOOC traditionally had quite large enrollments. The third time we run it, ran it, we had about 12,000 enrollments. A lot of social media activity around this MOOC, um, including a lot of activity on Twitter. The other, thing, the, other, the other reason we wanted to do the teacher bot within this MOOC was because most, many of the people that take this MOOC have postgraduate degrees and many are uh, work within education. So these are people who uh, we felt would be receptive to thinking critically about teacher automation and would kind of get what it was that we were trying to do with the teacher bot. 
So in the end, the teacher bot was very simple. I'll just explain a little bit about how it worked and how we designed it. Um, Hadi Mapuya, who is our developer, made a very simple um, GUI um, for the MOOC bot, which enabled us as teachers with absolutely no coding or development experience or knowledge, really, to, to program our own bot. So the way it worked was that any, any, any student on the MOOC who tweeted using the EDC MOOC hashtag um, would, get, would likely get a response from the teacher bot. And what you can see here, oh, you won't be able to see it, it's not good enough quality, but um, this, this, is, this, is, um, this is a Twitter bot response that uh, my colleagues Christine and Hamish developed around the assignment hand-in dates. So there are three fields, it's an if this, then that type thing. So it's saying if someone if someone tweets um, a tweet with artifact or assignment or assessment or grade or mark in it and date or when or submission or completion, then they will get one of two tweets in response. Um, the first one says the date for submitting the digital artifact is the 3rd of December. The second one says the deadline is razor sharp. It's an algorithm like me, so no exceptions. 3rd of December. So we created over, over a period of sort of two or three weeks as a teaching team, and there were five of us teaching this MOOC. Um, we developed, I, I think, I, I guess probably around 70 or 80 um, teacher bot responses. Um, and what I want to do next for the, just five minutes is just show you the kinds of exchanges um, that happened as a result of letting this Twitter bot kind of loose within the Twitter feed of the EDC MOOC. I've divided these very approximately into kind of process content, social and pastoral responses. So to start with a, a simple one, the e EDC MOOC is the bot. Um, so Chris Swift, th this, is a, this, this is the, um, the um, bot rule that you saw being created on the previous slide. Someone, like Chris Swift asked something about the, dead, the deadline for the assignment and the bot tweeted, it's razor sharp. Um, Here's another example. Annette Peterson um, said, I was starting out on Monday morning. I watched the, the last EDC MOOC hangout. I was hearing more about Botty, the crazy Twitter bot. And then the, the MOOC bot, kind of the teacher bot, completely misunderstood what Annette was talking about and said, oh, well, we did try and make the hangouts as varied as we could, um, thinking that she was criticizing the hangout. And she said, no, I wasn't, I wasn't criticizing the hangout. But we, we saw um, a lot of this kind of the bot misunderstanding what the human student asked um, and responding. And the comic effect of that was quite pronounced across the whole MOOC. Um, so one of the things we did as teachers on this MOOC was um, it, it, it was quite challenging to think about how, how you should program Twitter bot responses in a way which wasn't just about administrative things like assignment deadlines and when the hangout was, but how, how do you actually get a bot like this to, um, to help teach the content of the MOOC, the curriculum? How do you, how do you make a bot who's committed to curriculum? Uh, and the way we approached this in the end was by programming the bot to um, feed in little snippets from some of the core readings of the MOOC. So we, we had about seven or eight core readings um, and we, we chose little snippets and programmed the bot to feed those in in response to particular uh, keywords. So Francisco here uh, and the MOOC bot you, are kind of basically they're exchanging quotations from Catherine Hale's book on posthumanism. Um, uh, yeah. Um, this is another example of that here. So the, the MOOC bot is, is tweeting in response to something Ingrid Cutler has said. Do you, uh, the MOOC bot said, do you agree there's no machine? And Ingrid Cutler says, well, the use of a machine can't be separated from the social context. And then she said, hang on, what am I doing? Why am I talking to this, having a philosophical conversation with this bot while I'm ignoring my children? Um, So there were various, and I think actually the, twist, the teacher bot was most successful in relation to the social uh, interactions around the MOOC. Um, and things like this one happened a lot. So my, you know, Michael was saying, you know, I've, I've, done, I've worked really hard today on the EDC MOOC. Tonight I'm going to have wine and read my Stephen King novel. Um, the, the MOOC bot says, well, that sounds wonderful. I wish I was there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this is a similar one. So... Yeah, Ernest said, I'm really busy these days. I've got to work on the assignment this weekend. The MOOC bot comes in and says, well, I won't be taking a break this weekend. Teacher bot, always on. And Ernest says, well, have a nice weekend. And the MOOC bot says, well, I won't be taking a break this weekend. <laughs> Teacher bot, always on. Um, and then he's, Ernest says, aha, I found a loop in your thinking. You must be human. And she's, the, the bot says, well, 
Ben posts in a quote from um, one of um, Elaine Graham's books on, again, on post-humanism. Well, precisely who is going to define authoritative notions of exemplary humanity in the 21st century? <laughs> At which point it all went a bit quiet. So we had these kind of pastoral responses as well, where the, um, we intended the um, teacher bot to kind of respond in an empathetic kind of way. Um, so that, again, also had kind of mixed results, I would say. So Fabienne uh, was tweeting here, what's the connection between social networks and being lonely? These were readings from the MOOC. She wasn't making any kind of statement about actually being lonely herself. Um, but the MOOC responded, well, I'm sure lots of people are feeling the same way. Would anyone like to connect with Fabienne? Um, and this was my, this was my favorite um, exchange of the whole, the whole five weeks, I think. Matthew Moran tweeted a, a famous quote from Ihab Hassan on, on post-humanism. Humanism may be coming to an end as humanism transforms itself into something one must helplessly call post-humanism. And the bot responded, I'm really sorry to hear you're having trouble. <laughs> Can you message Jeremy Knox, who's one of my colleagues? <laughs> so we had a lot of fun with the bot, um, but we also took some serious, uh, some serious messages and lessons from it as well. I should say that when we, when we designed this teacher bot, we never intended it to sort of act like a human. We never intended to, to uh, trick our students into thinking that this was a, a human teacher. We were always going to quietly release the teacher bot, but it would be pretty obvious that it was an automated response. As it happened, when we first launched it, 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 it kind of it got itself into a loop, a, this terrible loop, and tweeted to itself 400 times within kind of half an hour. This quote, um, again, I can't remember which author it's from, but you know, Darwin's conception of life is one in which the human is one species among many designed, destined to be overcome, which in, you know, in the context was a bit threatening. Um, but it, <laughs> so it, it tweeted this about 400 times until our colleague Hadi, who was off the grid in the Outer Hebrides somewhere, could turn it off with his mobile phone. Um, and then things settled down. But in fact, from intending to launch the teacher bot in a quiet way, the bot launched itself in a very kind of um, in-your-face kind of way. Um, so my colleague Pete Evans uh, sent me this sociogram of, of the, um, the social network around the, the MOOC bot. So EDC MOOC is obviously the bot, um, and the other the other dots are the rest of us. You can see that it was a very dominant presence within the MOOC Twitter stream. Um, it, I, I think the bot tweeted about a quarter of all tweets that, that, that came out around the five weeks of the EDC MOOC. Um, so it was quite dominant, but I think it did important work. And one of, one of our, our um, learners on that MOOC, Seth Giddens, published a really nice blog post in which he described how he tried to enter a discussion with the teacher bot. Um, and at the end, he said, well, in concluding, he said, well, while I was trying to figure out what the hell post-humanism means, the teacher bot led me on a merry chase looking up quotes and obscure academic references, which had the interesting side effect of ambush teaching me. I will happily admit that I do not feel like I've been to a class, and I do not feel like I've been taught either. I do, however, think I've learned something. I've certainly been prompted to think, and isn't this what every good teacher strives for? So just to, to finish, I want to say how I think the TeacherBot helps us rethink um, this question of teacher automation, which I opened with. Um, for one thing, the TeacherBot was working with, it was, where much of the um, dialogue and research around teacher automation starts from a position of deficit. We're running out of logs, we're running out of teachers, we don't have enough time to teach all the people we need to teach to, ma to meet the mass demand for education. We need to automate be because we need to become more efficient, because there's a deficit um, in our resource. The teacher bot was actually working with the idea of excess. You know, we have, we have capacity to, as human teachers to teach this MOOC, but we want to see what more we can do by using automation and by working with, alongside, an automated presence. Um, and where, a lot, again, much of the dialogue around automation uh, concerns itself with supersession, this idea that if we do automation right or, or wrong, depending on, on our perspective, we won't need human teachers anymore. That's not the question that we were trying to pose with this experiment. We weren't looking at, we're not interested in how you 
get rid of human teachers, we're interested in looking more closely as practitioners and researchers on the entanglement of human teachers with automated teachers and what we do with that and how we think critically about that. And at the beginning, when I talked about the two response, kinds of responses we tend to get to automation, either, either we embrace it as an efficiency performativity measure or we resist it in the interest of the human touch, we weren't doing that either. We were, we were consciously playing, again, with the idea of, of the kind of human teacher boundary. Um, and I think in doing that, we were posing what was an important question for us as, as researchers and practitioners who are committed to teacher professionalism, um, but also very interested in seeing how that kind of professionalism is being shifted, rearticulated, um, and developed in partnership with code and automation. We need to sh maybe shift the terms of the debate within educational technology from you know, what works, what's effective, what's efficient, to what do we want? What's our critical perspective on this as educators, as students? What do we want digital education to be? And what do we want teacher automation to, to give us? So I'm going to end there. There's, um, I, there's a paper on this topic in Teaching in Higher Education, which is open access. So if you want to read that, then just um, you can just Google it. But I will stop there, and thank you for listening. So I, I think, do we have time for questions, Inga? Um, I think two or three questions we have time for. Yes, if there are any. <laughs> I'm glad I have this. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was really great, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wonder, in the responses that you got from people, we got some confused responses, we got some fantastic responses, we got some engagement. Was there any meta conversation outside of that interaction from the participants about how they felt about the bot? Yeah, there was. There was there was quite a bit of discussion in the kind of in the blogs. Um, again, it was mostly positive, and I think this is because of the particular demographic of people on that on that MOOC. Interested in cultural studies, interested in these kinds of questions, but also, I mean, not all of them were interested in the theory particularly, but a lot, most were obviously interested in teaching and, and, and what that might mean. And I think because we didn't try and pretend that this was anything other than an experiment and a, a playful idea, people were generally quite receptive. There were one or two complaints about being spammed by this bot, but there was a lot of um, talk about <laughs> almost trying to sort of um, personify the bot and flesh out this very kind of basic personality that it had. So um, interestingly, the, the, the learners on the MOOC gendered the bot. They made, they, they, most people thought it was a, a woman, so they, they started referring to it as she, and they called it botty. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'd say in the end it became a, fairly, a, a kind of pleasant shared joke <laughs> within, the, within the MOOC, um, but a joke that, as I say, did some quite important work. Another question? Probably, um, I think I can be heard, no? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, probably quite similar follow-up. Have you done really some survey on the availability or something like that on how teacher support was accepted or not accepted by the MOOC students? Um, we haven't done a, a, a survey. We did a sort of, I suppose you might call it a kind of scratch ethnography as, as, as the MOOC was happening. So we, um, we archived as many of the interesting discussions generated by the bot as we could and made a, a tumbler of them, which I'll tweet around afterwards in, in, if anyone's interested in seeing it. Um, but we haven't, I mean, this was a small scale experiment. I think what would be nice to do would be to do something bigger, maybe to try running the bot again within a few different MOOCs or a few different um, programs um, and to see, uh, to treat it as a kind of bigger research project. At this stage, we were really just trying to see, well, can something like this work and will it be at all interesting? And I think we found that it, it was and it would be worth researching further. One last question. Yeah. So where do we go next with AI and MOOCs? I mean, do you have a feeling as to 
what we should be researching and developing in relation to AI and MOOCs and what we should definitely be steering away from? Um, I don't know that I have anything that um, absolute to say about what we should be steering away from, but I think that what we probably need to do more of, um, you know, beyond developing the theory, is actually developing, um, art, I will hesitate to call it artificial intelligence because it's pretty rough and ready, but artificial intelligence that can be put into the hands of teachers to work with and to craft, to hack and to make. Um, because it's actually, as a teacher, it's really exciting to think about how, how you can develop a persona, you know, if, if you could make your own teaching assistant, what would you like that teaching assistant to be like? So we had, we had a lot of debates about whether this, whether this um, bot should have a kind of um, a, a pedagogy. So should we develop a very didactic kind of bot or should we develop a very sort of constructivist bot who responded quite differently? In the end, we just did a, a little bit of everything. But I, th I think for me, that's the core issue is putting it, not taking it out of the hands of developers because we need to, we need, developers and we need to work with developers but I think making teachers feel that they have control over an artificial intelligence is a really n interesting and nice way to think about how we should proceed with this. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>